And the reason that they gained power was because they had much greater access to the emperor and to imperial women because they didn't pose a threat. Zhang Ha soon rose through the ranks to become the chief lieutenant to the emperor himself. Together, they sketched out a bold plan for conquest of the seas. Zhang Ha was named to lead an extraordinary fleet of ships. It was an engineering challenge unlike anything a Chinese dynasty had ever attempted. He was somebody who definitely wanted to create a personal stamp on the world. He ordered 337 ocean-going ships. An additional 188 flat-bottom transports were converted for ocean travel. Just to get the building materials together, get the craftsmen, get the designers and all the rest, and then, say, put together a fleet of 300 ships is remarkable. I mean, the British fleet in the time of uh, Napoleon had had a really an upper limit of about 100 ships of the line, men of war. An army of 30,000 carpenters, sailmakers, and sailwrights worked and lived at the shipyards, working day and night on Zheng Ha's magnificent fleet. At the center of the enormous shipyard, seven 1,500-foot dry docks were separated from the Yangtze River by 25-foot high dams. Once the ships were complete, the dams were opened, flooding the dry docks. The flagship of the fleet was a spectacular nine-masted vessel measuring 440 feet, nearly 1.5 times the length of a football field, making it the largest wooden ship ever built. Designed for stability, it had a flat bottom filled with heavy ballasts of stones and an innovative exterior rudder post that could be raised to reduce the ship's draft in shallow waters. Watertight bulwark compartments, inspired by the partition shape of bamboo stalks, stored drinking water and supplies and kept the ship afloat if the hull was breached. The second deck had living quarters for the crew. The kitchen, mess hall, and operations were on the third, while the fourth deck was used as a high fighting platform. Fully rigged, the flagships had nine staggered masts and 12 square sails of red silk soaring skyward. Other ships were armed with as many as 24 bronze cannons capable of firing up to 900 feet. Their bows and sterns had reinforced high profiles for ramming smaller boats. Some ships carried horses or transported troops. Others were freshwater tankers packed with provisions for up to 28,000 men. We're talking about a really, really big fleet. It had as many soldiers and sailors on it as the Spanish Armada of 1588. It had about twice as many ships. In 1405, the eunuch commander Zheng He set sail for the world. Zheng He was not an explorer. Uh, what Zheng He was doing was what we would call in modern terminology power projection. During his 28-year naval career, Admiral Zheng He visited 37 countries, traveled around the tip of Africa into the Atlantic Ocean, and commanded a single fleet whose numbers surpassed the fleets of all Europe combined. Zhang Ha's voyages established China as a superpower on the world's oceans. But in 1433, China's age of exploration came to a crashing halt. Zhang Ha suddenly died during a stopover in India, and the fleet was recalled to China. A new emperor was on the throne. In one stunning command, he would change the course of Chinese history. Despite China's total domination as a naval power, Zhang Ha's magnificent fleet was to be burned to the ground. It would be one of the great turning points in Chinese history. China was poised to seize control of the seas and colonize the world years before the Portuguese, Spanish, Dutch, and British. Under the new emperor, all ocean-going vessels were destroyed. Even records of Zheng He's expeditions were torched. China's age of exploration was over, 
the open door slammed shut. The ships were gone, and the promise of international power and conquest was dead. The reason for the emperor's decision remains a mystery to this day. 1449, 16 years after the empire turned inward again, China's age-old enemy returned. Mongol forces mounted a massive attack. Like great dynasties before them, the Ming returned to the wall for protection. The result would be the most monumental feat of the entire Chinese empire. A complex re-engineering of the Great Wall into the colossal structure we know today. Earlier walls had been primarily made of tamped earth. The Ming walls were faced with, a, with brick and stone. They were much more solid, and those are the ones that we can still see parts of today. A crude mortar of sticky rice and burnt lime created a seal between bricks that rivaled modern cement in strength. Construction of military fortifications on the Great Wall reached its peak under the Ming. Double walls were added in military zones, along with strongholds, passes, and other reinforcements. Watchtowers of various shapes and sizes served as shelters or simply as signal stations along the wall. Shelter towers were built large enough to store food and arms and serve as the living quarters for soldiers. A staircase from the interior led up to the top of the tower, with small holes on each side of the wall for lookouts. The overall defenses were enhanced with a variety of features, including artillery. The Chinese have a clear superiority over the Mongols in gunpowder weapons. And uh, as long as the Ming Dynasty could maintain a cohesive enough army along the Great Wall, uh, they were capable of resisting individual Mongol attacks. By the end of the Ming Dynasty, over 6,000 miles of wall, including its many loops and digressions, sprawled across northern China. For a century and a half, the wall stood firm, but by 1600, the dynasty behind it was crumbling, and a foreign tribe known as the Manchu were gathering strength on China's northern border. On May 26, 1644, Beijing finally fell to Manchu forces. It would take the Chinese more than 250 years to overthrow the invaders from the north, but when they did, a new Chinese kingdom emerged, like none before it, communist China. Nothing symbolizes the enduring power and imagination of the Chinese more than this great wall. Of all of the civilizations that have reached the glorious heights of empire, only one has avoided the inevitable oblivion that follows. Emperors come and go, but for thousands and thousands of years, from the dedication and vision and resilience and brilliance of these remarkable people, they have pushed their civilization to triumph again and again and again, where others have simply morphed or dissolved or just faded away. At the dawn of humanity, the Chinese were here, and they are still here, and they ain't finished yet. I'm Peter Weller for the History Channel.